Hello, friends. This is the Neatarts Friends Church podcast. We are Jesus people, kingdom of God people, welcoming, yearning, sharing. And we're glad you're connecting here with us. We'd love to connect in person as well. If you're inclined to support this podcast or for more information, just hop on over to neatartsfriends.org. That's neatartsfriends.org. Let's jump into today's sermon. The Storms That Knock You Down Life on planet Earth is full of storms. It's full of struggles, full of experiences that flood you, full of problems. You'd like to be able to live above the clouds, up where the sun is always shining, where even the ugliest storm clouds just look like cute cotton candy. But you're stuck living below the clouds, where the rain clouds burst and the torrents and the floods pile up and they hit you. And sometimes the floods, the storms of life cause you to collapse. They knock your feet out from under you. You become grumpy, snappy, mean, reactive. You develop unrealistic demands on others. You lose your temper. You blow a gasket. You do something drastic. You become non-functional, paralyzed. You lose your mind. You run out of answers. You run out of mojo. You become disorganized, overwhelmed. You fall into depression, self-loathing, you become fearful, anxious, fall into addictions, unhealthy methods of self-soothing. You become an uglier version of yourself. And the nature of collapse, the nature of getting flooded and having your feet knocked out from under you is that things spiral out of control. They snowball. And once the collapse has begun, It can feel impossible to get turned around. It's really hard to get your feet back under you. The longer I live and the more humans I get to know, the more I'm amazed by the storms that people are able to withstand and the strength, generosity, gratitude, joy, love, peace, resilience that people are able to exhibit while living through massive storms in their life major medical events that they go through, the death of loved ones, getting laid off, facing tragedies, being a victim of a crime, experiencing a natural disaster, immigrants, war refugees, asylum seekers, and on and on. At the same time that I am amazed at the storms that some humans are able to weather, I'm also aware that there are storms, there are floods that knock us all down. And they come from unexpected places. Sometimes we're flooded by circumstances. Sometimes we're flooded by emotions. There are storms that we never imagined and we weren't prepared for. And sometimes they're big. Sometimes they're small. Sometimes they pile up. But somehow they cause us to collapse. We weren't braced for it. They knock our feet out from under us. They carry us away down the river, and we struggle to regain our footing. Think about a moment when a flood of events or a flood of emotions caused you to collapse into an uglier version of yourself. You were braced for work to be super stressful, for your boss to be the worst, but you weren't ready for your spouse to say something negative, some negative comment, and somehow you came unglued. You were braced to fight cancer, but when your sibling told you they were getting a divorce, that's when it felt like the ground under your feet was no longer steady and you felt lost. You knew that the repairs on the house might cost twice as much as you hoped, and you could handle that stress. But when your best friend in town told you they were moving away, that's when you became paralyzed and felt like all of life was unmanageable. You were braced to deal with your parents' alcoholism, but you never imagined how complex, isolating, lonely, exhausting, 
it might be to parent a child with special needs, and that's when you found yourself tempted to fall into your own unhealthy addictive tendencies. You were braced for the election season to be rocky, and you were doing a good job staying above the hatred and the vitriol, but you hadn't planned on the neighbor kids coming over and infesting your house somehow with bedbugs. And getting rid of the bedbugs ended up being a nightmare, and in the process, you built up more hatred and vitriol and used more choice words for the neighbor family than you care to admit. You were braced for the death of your parents, and overall, you felt like your grief was authentic and healthy walking through that, but when your entire flower garden died unexpectedly, it felt debilitating and you couldn't get your feet back under you. You thought you were handling working 60 hours a week okay, plus juggling about 12 different other odds and ends. But something small happened with the kids in the car, and you totally lost it. You blew a gasket. It wasn't pretty. As much as we would like life to be all sunshine and rainbows, sooner or later, it seems like everyone gets the storm they weren't prepared for. They get the flood that they weren't imagining. And even the strongest of people get their feet knocked out from under them. They collapse. They get flooded. They get carried down the river. So the discussion question that we discussed with one another on Sunday, I'd invite you to reflect on this. When you consider the difference between the storms that you have weathered well and the floods of events or emotions that have carried you down the river, what differences do you see? So take a moment and reflect on that. This brings us to the conclusion of Jesus' Sermon on the Plain in Luke chapter 6. Jesus painted a picture of a way of life, a set of practices that he was inviting people into. And I'll sum it up. These are the practices. Love your enemies. Do good things for people who are mean to you. Pray for good things to happen to people who are mean to you. Don't retaliate. Don't one-up and perpetuate hostility. Practice generosity. Give without expecting anything back. Treat others how you want to be treated. Be kind and merciful. Do not judge. Do not condemn. Forgive. Follow that forgiveness up with more generosity. Practice self-examination. Work on yourself rather than on others. Focus on storing up goodness in your heart. And now Jesus ends his sermon. After sharing, inviting us into these practices, here's what he says. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. Now, I've encountered people who hear what Jesus says here in different ways. 
Some people receive these words of Jesus as a message of failure because they look at the list of 11 practices that Jesus has just described, and then they look at their life and they say, I should be further along by now. How is it that I'm X years old and I'm just now barely figuring out how to do these things, even with my family or at work? I'm just really bad at all of this. And so they encounter this message of Jesus primarily as like a failure message. Then there are people who receive these words of Jesus as a threat message. It's, it's a fear message because they say, well, I call Jesus Lord. I call Jesus Savior. But I also have a really hard time controlling my temper. I retaliate. Sometimes I hold grudges. And so then they say, boy, if I can't get this under control, does Jesus even recognize that I call him Lord? Like, does he recognize the loyalty that I have for him? And it, it creates a cycle of fear for them. Some people receive these words of Jesus and they hear Jesus saying, you have to earn your salvation, which brings up a lot of emotions, mostly of resistance in them. They say, this sounds like we're saved by our works, by our actions. And I don't believe that because I think we're saved by grace. And so then they take those 11 practices that Jesus said, love your enemies, etc. And they say, I, I don't. I think those are good ideas, but I don't think that everything's riding on that. Like, I don't think that's something that we actually have to do. Those are just like the ideal. And so then they, they try to somehow wiggle out of responsibility to put Jesus' words into practice. Is there another way to hear what Jesus is saying? I hear Jesus looking at the floods that carry us down the river and approaching us from a place of care and dignity. He knows the suffering that drowning people experience. Jesus has seen the storms and the floods of life knock people off their feet, get their feet knocked out from under them, carry them down the river, and Jesus has compassion on every drowning person, every flooded person. And sure, from the outside, a flooded person, a drowning person, looks like a complete mess. What they try to do to their rescuers, to anyone around them, looks bizarre. They, they look like they're attacking the person who's trying to even help them. But from the inside of their flooded experience, their drowning experience, their ex what they're doing makes perfect sense. In their state of collapse, what they're doing is even creative. The amount of effort that they're displaying is unbelievable. It's a desperate attempt to adapt and survive. And they're suffering. And Jesus cares about the suffering of every drowning person who gets hit by a flood of events or a flood of emotions and gets carried away down the river. And Jesus isn't trying to should on anyone. You should, you should, you should. He isn't trying to use fear or failure as a motivator. He's trying to offer you a gift. It's a, a proactive word. It's a saving word. It's a grounding word. He's trying to help you get your feet on the ground. He's trying to help. It, it's nearly impossible to teach a drowning person to swim. It's hard to get their feet on the ground. And so Jesus is moving the conversation upriver before the flood hits. If you don't have a way to get your feet firmly planted before the storm breaks and before the flood waters hit, you're going to collapse and you're going to suffer. Jesus is trying to offer a set of practices that can help keep you grounded instead of getting washed down the river.
carried away by the emotions that flood you in the midst of life. Jesus isn't trying to make you earn anything. He's not trying to scare you. He's not trying to tell you you're a failure. He's trying to keep you from the suffering of falling apart in a million different ways and hurting everyone around you and losing everything. Dallas Willard says this to those who resist what Jesus says here because they say, well, no, I'm saved by grace. Dallas Willard says, action is a receptacle for grace. It's not a substitute for it. Grace is God acting in our lives to do things we can't do on our own. Grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. So, yeah, Jesus is calling you to action. He's calling you to effort. These practices that Jesus is calling us to, they aren't meant, however, to come out of a a place or a posture of obligation or fear or self-righteousness. They're meant to come out of a posture of receiving from God, all of them. Before any of these practices of loving our enemies, not judging, forgiving, before they are about effort, before they are about muscling our way into something, they come from a place of receiving from God. Jesus makes this clear. He says, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back because then you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Can you hear the receiving there? The Apostle John says it this way, says, We love because he first loved us. 1 John 4.19 You can only give what you have received. And the love that Jesus gives to you is unconditional. It's not transactional. It's not reactive. Jesus expects more failure from you than you expect from yourself. Jesus isn't surprised when you run the other direction, when you collapse, when you get flooded and the flood carries you down the river, when you act in a dysfunctional or destructive way. Jesus is kind and generous with you. He's forgiving. He loves you and he will keep on loving you. So how do you keep your footing when the storms hit you? Well, these are the practices. Jesus says these are the practices to make your bedrock, your foundation, your place of grounding, your second nature, that the habits of your life, and they are all about receiving. Jesus wants you to experience what it's like to practice these in so many itty-bitty, humdrum, no-big-deal scenarios of life that they just become second nature. They aren't like you're, they're not just muscle memory. They are out of receiving from God. It's been said when you adopt any new practice, any new habit, you really shouldn't evaluate it. You shouldn't say, is it working? Is it not working for at least like 40 days? You should just let yourself settle into it. Believe that it's a gift that Jesus is giving you and believe that it's changing you, believe that it's making a difference, and just keep returning to it. And what Jesus is telling you is that ultimately this is where the grounding is. He's saying it is possible to experience the flood of events, the flood of emotions, and go through that experience. And it is possible to be able to look back and say, wow, I've been working on staying in a posture of receiving from God. I've been working on living out of that space. And somehow in the midst of this storm, I didn't collapse. I didn't get flooded. I didn't get carried down the river. Somehow I was able to stay in a space of love and generosity rather than retaliation and hostility. I was able to stay in a space of kindness and mercy I was able to be non-judgmental and forgiving. I, I focused on myself and 
how I need to grow, not the problems of the other person. And wow, what came out of my heart in this experience was really beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Jesus isn't saying that the storms aren't going to hit you. He's not saying that it, the floods won't come, that it's possible to live above the clouds in this life. He's telling you how to keep your feet on the ground. Before we close today, I, I want to share a bit of my own personal experience here and something that I've learned so far. There are 11 practices here. And if you asked me to look at this list and then said, do you have these in the bag? Like, are these second nature for you yet? I would have to look at this list and say, sadly, no. And I could just leave it there and feel defeated because there's an inner critic voice that would say, to, I, you know, I'd say to myself, well, Jesus says, do these things. You're not doing them all. You're a pastor, for goodness sake. Like, what's wrong with you? And so if I wanted to, I could probably spin that cycle for my entire life beat myself up about it, but that cycle is really defeating. And I've come to realize that if I just do that cycle, then I'm missing out on something else that's really powerful. New York Times journalist Charles Duhigg, best-selling author of the book The Power of Habit, he says that every habit has three components. He says there's a cue or a trigger, there's a routine or a behavior, and then there's a reward. And he says every habit has all three of these. Whether you're aware of it or not, it, it has all three components. And he points out that we often think of changing a habit by focusing on the middle part. Uh, we like that's what we want to change. We're like, man, I, I need to do better, so I need to change my behavior. I need to change my routine. That's where we focus. But his research has found that actually our greatest leverage is with the cue and with the reward. He says this is where we actually change the behavior by focusing on the cue. And by focusing on the reward. So the cue is in many ways staying in that receiving posture with God as I make my way through life. But the reward, the lesson that I'm learning more recently is the importance of celebrating the small wins. That's the reward. When I'm able to stay in a receiving posture in my relationship with God, I do find it easier to live these words of Jesus out in small moments of life. And when I'm living these practices out, love your enemies, don't be judgmental, be forgiving, be generous, then I experience some small wins. And so I make it through a moment in my day where I was loving, where I was non-judgmental, and I think, hey, I can think of a time in my life earlier when the situation I just encountered would have flooded me. I would have gotten carried down the river quite a ways, but I didn't do it today. I'm, I'm still here. My feet are still grounded in the soil of God's love, and that feels really good to be living in these practices of Jesus. And, and so I'm learning to celebrate that as a win. And I believe Jesus celebrates that win with me. And I'm learning how important it is to celebrate that as a win. Celebrating the small win actually helps reinforce the practice that I'm trying to build. It's interesting. Jesus says, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And I've often thought of that reward as some kind of a, you know, at the end of history thing. Uh, and so I've thought, you know, there's no space for me to really 
celebrate the win right now. And I haven't thought of celebrating the small win with Jesus right now. I haven't thought of the value of that. But I'm beginning to see that I, that's actually very important. I, I need to celebrate the small win right now with Jesus. And none of this means that I get it right every time. But when the flood hits me sideways, when it knocks me for a loop, which it does at times, I don't hear Jesus belittling me. I don't hear him talking down to me. I hear him calling me back to this posture of receiving, saying, I love you. You're able. You're capable. Love your enemies. Do good things for people who are mean to you. Pray for good things to happen to people who are mean to you. Don't retaliate. Don't one up. Don't perpetuate hostility. Practice generosity. Give without expecting anything back. Treat others how you want to be treated. Be kind. Be merciful. Don't judge. Don't condemn. Forgive. Follow that forgiveness up with more generosity. Practice self-examination. Work on yourself rather than others. Focus on storing up goodness in your heart. And I feel my feet getting grounded again. I feel them sinking down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. So, a final discussion question, final reflection question for you. What's going on when you slip out of a receiving posture with God? What's going on with you? And what helps you celebrate the small wins with God? Thank you for joining us for a Sunday sermon from Neatart's Friends Church. We hope you'll join us soon for one of our in-person worship gatherings. For more information, hop on over to neatartsfriends.org. God's peace be with you, friends.